Hey, this is Ross Payton with Role Playing Public Radio. This is RPPR episode 186 of Wiretapping and Labor Organizing Scenario Ideas or Scenario Workshop, something like that. Say hello, Thad. Oh, hello. And we're going to be uh, workshopping some I- some loose ideas we have for scenarios. Uh, we'll explain more about that later uh, after we do a bit of news. But the basic idea is I've had this idea for scenario. And I was like, hey, what, Thad's available to talk. We haven't talked to him in a while. Why don't we just like, I come yes, with I'm an so idea. so lonely. You know, <laughs> and we'll just uh, see what we can think uh, about these scenarios. Um, so uh, in news, though, um, I am doing currently a survey uh, for the RPPR Patreon. Uh, it's open to everybody. So I'll have a link in the show notes. So if you can... Click on that link and submit your answers about what you, if you are a patron, if you're not a patron, um, what you would be interested in as a patron, um, what you're not interested in, things of that nature uh, that'll help me because I am working on improving the RPPR Patreon. Also for the RPPR Patreon, I'm changing RPPR Illustrated. uh, So instead of Mm -hmm. illustrating episodes for the uh, actual play episodes, we're going to start doing some things that can be used as handouts in games. Uh, like Ooh. a series of maps. So October's uh, RPPR Illustrated will be a map for base raiders or any superhero game. It's not going to have it's going to have a description, but it's not going to have game mechanics. So you can like insert your own systemless stuff mapping. Yeah. So um, I if I get a sketch from uh, Patsy, I'll, I'll put that up there. But that is something to look forward to for the RPPR Patreon in October. That news, unless you have any news, that uh, do you have anything you want to plug real quick? Uh, I kind of, um, starting probably the first full week in October, I'm gonna start doing some f- regular streaming on Twitch. I don't have the schedule lined out yet, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to be streaming readings of public domain literature Ooh. because uh, my five year old laptop is not really good for game streaming, but yeah. Uh, that's fair. But I figured I would start with some some nice spoopy picks. Oh, I found, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I found out that the uh, first issue of Weird Tales is in the public domain. So I was sort of skimming through that the other day. And uh, I think I might also uh, go through the entirety of The King in Yellow over a few streams. Because uh, that seems appropriate considering the company I keep. <laughs> what? 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 Uh, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's kind of like I have a thing. But uh, yeah. I'll, I'll have the schedule posted once I figure out what it will be. Um, in the meantime, if you want to, like, I don't know, follow me to find out. Uh, it's Thaddeus Strange on Twitch, just like on Twitter. So the idea I had for this episode um, came about after I watched this uh, limited series on Netflix called Fear City. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's a three-part series about the mafia in New York in the early 80s and how that was taken down. Now, warning, they do interview Rudy Giuliani uh, because he was the lead prosecutor. Yeah, (laughs) I was going to say because of his experience being incredibly corrupt. Well, I mean, he did. He was the district attorney for New York and did prosecute these mob bosses. Um, But... The bulk of the series is about the tradecraft of how the FBI built their case against the mob. And part of it, like even Rico, um, the the racketeer uh, organized crime law had been passed a decade before, but like they didn't know how to use it. So they figured out how to use it and how to build cases. And this was like their big <laughs> test case. And they, you got to love when they pass a law that they don't know what to do with. Mm-hmm. So the... The, so a lot of this episode, a lot of this series, sorry, is about these uh, inter- FBI agents talking about how they got their evidence to submit in court. And they did it primarily through wiretapping uh, because obviously they couldn't get witnesses because, you know, it's the fucking mob. <laughs> like if you talk to the mob about you can testify in court, like, oh, yeah, that guy ordered, uh, you know, Joey to be shot. So, you know, yeah, that guy that we never see anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Um, they talk about how they planted the bugs. And then like the thing that really struck me that really interested me was like this FBI agent was like, I listened to this mob boss for 600 hours. I just Oof. listened to him and his life. Cause we planted the bug in his house, in his TV. So we could hear all kinds of shit happening. We could hear everything. 
Um, wow. All kinds of conversations. And so I knew this guy really well. I knew his schedule. I knew his family. I knew that he was having an affair with his maid. Um, and so and that really fascinated me because, like, that's kind of a staple of law enforcement, of investigation, of building cases against criminals, mm. um, is listening to them talk and uh you don't get to say can you talk about your crimes please you just have to take whatever you can get uh so my idea is like why not do an investigative game where the player characters their only real method of getting evidence well not their only method but their primary method like the team of pcs are the ones focusing on this method of collection yeah is that they have the wiretap so like my, obviously, I think Delta Green because that's, you know, the most like <laughs> cop kind of like <laughs> investigative RPG that I really uh, role play as. I mean, you could do it in Unknown Armies. You could do it for yourself. You could do it in any number of modern horror games. But it'd have to be modern because obviously you mm. need wiretaps. You need bugs. Um, but and it doesn't have to be that modern. You yeah. could go a little bit into the past. Well, yeah, yeah. But not like a fantasy thing. Not like no, uh, yeah. not not like a steampunk thing actually uh, now i'm imagining how you would do fantasy wiretapping like send a send your familiar in there to listen in and <laughs> well i mean that's thing is they have to re-listen to this over and over again they also have to and like they they eventually have these things transcribed so it really yeah so you just have uh, a familiar that's a parrot <laughs> um so that's the idea though it's like that that's like very like the typical RPG thing is like let mm. players wander around crime scenes, make skill checks, talk to people. And as they, they, they it's a very active thing, you know, where they go around and gather evidence and then they have to figure out what that evidence means. Um, like that's the challenge of um, an investigative game is interpreting the evidence, not finding the evidence, because it's a very binary thing. If you don't find the evidence, you know, you just, well, there's nothing to interpret. There's yeah. So, um, the, my so my initial thing a blank wall yeah exactly so my initial thing was that um delta green scenario the framing device would be like the player characters are self delta green agents that are totally outside the investigation um mm. but they have an npc fbi agent on the inside and we'll just say the target is the businessman um and the businessman is a corrupt businessman who like is being wiretapped because he's laundering money for drug dealers, but he's done. He's, he's just up to his arms and corruption. Mm. Um, and Delta green has some evidence that he is going to make a deal in like a month or something like that. Not, not, not like immediately, but pretty soon. Mm. Um, and this deal is where he's going to like sell or pick up a mythos artifact, like the Necronomicon or, you know, a sacrificial dagger or something Delta green yeah, something. really fucking wants. Something you know. Delta Green flagged. Yeah. And they don't know who he's meeting with. And they the so what the NPC FBI agent is doing is copying all of the wiretaps that they get and routing it to the PCs. And the PC's job is to figure out where and when that meet is going to be so they can go and get the thing. Um, and they don't have to build a case against them. They just have to get the thing. So... um. But that's their main challenge is you only have these wiretaps and they're given instructions to not interact with the businessman at all. Like, obviously, they can. They can ignore those or orders. Yeah, yeah. But if they tail him and if they talk to him, he's going to get suspicious and he could change his habits. And um, they can't ruin that sh that one chance of when they 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 know that the, the Necronomicon is going to be um, – you yeah, know, so they're they're barred all other interaction except for those uh, wiretaps. Well, barred is a hard word. They're told not to do it, but like part of being a Delta Green agent they're, is like they're institutionally the barred. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, well, you can you can ignore that. <laughs> yeah, well, like they're told like up to the at the end, it's their judgment. So if they think hmm. it's worth it, especially if they think they know where the Necronomicon is early, then obviously they can. They're, they're, the main thing is, do they get the Necronomicon or not? Mm. Um, and the second thing is, do they blow the NBC FBI agents cover? So they can't <laughs> like, they can, they can send messages to the FBI agent. Uh, but like, it's a very, very limited, 
Like they can't just like, hey, can you who's this guy? Who's this guy? Can you give us these dossiers? Like, no, you don't get those dossiers. Hmm. Um, you don't you don't know. You only have the wiretaps. You just have to listen, you know, so like the way the, the Delta Green cell or leadership is like, we just need people to listen to all this shit to figure out where the meat is. That's easy. We'll, we'll just have the NPCs do or we'll, you know, um, but like to play your characters. So the, cha- the so that's like the framework of the scenario. And then like, obviously for me, my my things, oh, they're going to find some other shit out that's going to like try and lure them into taking direct action in some way. Yeah. So, so that was my first sort of thought is like what uh, I mean, aside from structurally, like how you're going to be, I guess, delivering the wiretap information, mm-hmm. like how specific it is versus how like general based on roles that they are making. Uh, but also things like managing red herrings uh, mm-hmm. or even if they're not red herrings, just like other legitimate threats. This guy is an actual like organized crime dude. Like they they may find out about murders or something. Well, like, again, he's not like an organized, he's not like a mob boss. He's just like a corrupt businessman who oh, okay. oh, yeah, makes yeah. deals with it. He's like, I, I picture him as like one of those, like the guy who actually owns the car dealership and is just knows everybody, but is just hasn't found a scam or a scheme or p- like bit of sleaze. Like dealerships don't kill people? Yeah, no. well, not directly, but they know people oh. who know people, you know. <laughs> and so if they complain to the right person about, uh, won't someone rid me of this troublesome reporter, uh, <laughs> then that reporter tends to disappear. Um, yeah, they keep talking about how my deals aren't the best in town. and mm-hmm. uh, So um, so the first thing that like, so here's the idea I have. I picture this as kind of like a spreadsheet. Um, or like, you know, the game Battleship, where mm. your 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 enemy's shit is on a grid, and you have to figure out where it is on the grid. Yeah. And um, but instead of the enemy taking shots at you, there's you only have so many shots to take. Like there's a clock, obviously. Yeah, like the clock is the main thing you're working against. And the thing is, the player characters, I'm going to strictly limit what they can do in terms of time without blowing their own cover, because mm. they're doing this basically as extracurricular work. Like they're not working on this full time. They still have their own personal lives to deal with. Mm. So um, I picture like there's going to be like three things, three taps, three bugs um, on his personal phone, his cell phone, um, on his office landline and um, like his Alexa um, at his home. Mm. Like, you know, since or a smart TV, basically they've they've hacked every single smart device that has a microphone right and so like it's a lot easier to bug people now if you could just hack the internet of things and there's nothing wrong with that Mm -hmm. so they have all those so they have three columns and then there's a timeline of like and so like i would just make you know from six eight like at eight a.m he makes a, a a you know call on his phone you know, there's activity at his house from this time to this time. Uh, there's an activity. There's a call on his office landline at this time. And so the player characters each day of the investigation, or each section, they would get like so many shots, so many boxes that they can open up. Or once they do that, they can also take other actions too. like, well, they can just do their own investigation. They do have research and investigation skills they can do their own background research and look up this dude on databases and build up their own dossier on him Um, but also if they're investigating outside that that's less time they can spend listening exactly and eventually they'll want to follow up some leads because they Mm -hmm. like he talks about this warehouse um but he also talks about this cabin out in the woods well, and the, the way he was ref- in the woods, you said. <laughs> and so, like, which one could be the, the site? Maybe they want to plant their own, like, uh, a trail cam on a tree in the cabin in the woods so that they, mm. the, that has wireless access so they can, like, check up on the cabin anytime they want to to see if somebody's there. Um, something like that. Um, and give them sort of opportunities to investigate along various tracks. Mm hmm. So, um, so that's my idea. And, um, what do you, what do you think of that basic premise? Uh, no, I, I like it a lot because of how it, like, I mean, just from a, I guess from a writing standpoint, I always find a lot of creative options come forth when you 
impose very specific limitations on yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like this is one of those opportunities. Uh, I mean, if we're, if we're sort of presuming Delta green, cause it makes the most sense, uh, to, to cut off the normal or at least disincentivize the normal modes of investigation or intimidation that you might normally do in, in a game like this. So I, I like that a lot as a premise. Um, I, I mean, I honestly, the, one of the things I find myself thinking about first is like how you're, how you present this to the, uh, to the players, like what, what the actual, I guess what the role playing of the, the things that you listen and like how you, you arrange what sections give what information I get. I, I mean, I assume you just would end up creating a fairly large spreadsheet for the person running the game as well. Yeah. So, yeah. I, and the thing about the timeline, whether the deadline is a month or a week, I don't know. Mm. So like I would probably start it like the wiretaps have already like I would start it like the players are already at deficit. Like it's already been running for like a couple of days by the time this is set up, mm. like by the time the FBI agent is able to figure out how to copy over all the wiretap recordings without being caught. So like the players start like on day four or five. So there's like four or five days of back recordings. Yeah. So they could go, go back and dig through old stuff, mm -hmm. but that'll eat up opportunities to listen to what's going on in the present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there would be certain clues that if they find them and they realize their value will guide them. So like one would be um, maybe like the guy does pass along his initial dossier of the guy. And that'll have like not only his basic info, but like um, an email with his regular daily schedule. Hmm. And so the player characters um, every day can look to see they can they'll like for especially for the past days, they'll know when there is a recording because, you know, when the house is empty, it doesn't you know, there's no recording. Um, there's no sound. Uh, mm. so they don't have to like worry about listening to the house 24 seven to make sure, you know, is there a person in there? Yeah. Uh, yeah it like only this... starts recording when there's sound. Like, yeah. So yeah, you're not literally scrubbing through audio tape at least. Yeah. So they can see like, Oh, he's supposed to be at lunch, but he went back home for 10 minutes mm. to talk. And there, 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 or wait, there's a 10 minute burst in here when he's, when, when there's talking during his lunch hour, that's weird. Why don't we listen to that? So like, yeah, I mean, that's definitely one thing that like the, the first like three or four days or whatever that block is, can be used to do is, is if they take the time, they can use it to plot out like timelines mm -hmm. of, of things better or, or, to figure mm -hmm. out maybe how to aim things in the future but you know but they might also miss this or that yeah you know, i like mm -hmm. that balance um and now that i'm thinking about it like i guess another clue would be like player characters could make there would be like a side quest where they get a, a greater access to his phone mm -hmm. um to um so they can download it or copy uh, uh, his gps uh, location data mm -hmm. um as long as the phone is turned on and it's not always turned on um, like he's not dumb enough to take the cell phone with him on his illicit meets. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but that would be another thing. So they, they could do that. So I guess, yeah, like, uh, yeah, those, those sort of side risk of a reward sort of things. Mm -hmm. So like, especially they know where like, he is most of the time, but like not all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially if you, you're attempting to get access to the cell phone like that, that can draw attention from either the person being bugged or the people the like the the federal agencies that you're also taking shit from. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe another thing though is the player characters. Um, maybe a person could spend a day to feed all the data into like an AI transcription service mm. um, to get like 80%, 80, 90% accuracy of these transcripts. Uh, so like instead of listening to the four days, they could just dump it into a program that renders it out as text. Um, and then listen to the spots that don't like that weren't transcribed correctly. Mm. Um, and so that I mean, I would help some yeah. of like yeah. access to or knowledge of how to do some of this would probably also be mitigated by like player skills or what mm -hmm. their backgrounds are and things like that. Right. Like someone high with computer science and SIGINT would be able to like you need SIGINT to improve the quality of the audio and then computer. <laughs> so science this is to, operate yeah. heavy machinery, but with SIGINT. <laughs> yeah. To a degree, yeah. Uh, I mean, they could take other. They could take. They could, for example, uh, plant bugs and uh, a tracking device on his car. 
they could spend a day to do that um mm. and because that would be uh they could do it while it's a, you you know they know where he is at his office and so if they could figure out how to go to the dealership and like where his car is like oh yeah so you want to buy a new car thunk and put it on the bumper um so and the question then becomes do they tell the npc fbi agent because the fbi might actually do that on their own in yeah. which case they really would be surprised to find another, another bug tracking off. device yeah, yeah so um so yeah, now they th- yeah, I, I I like that idea. Um I feel like though this is going to be a lot of work to set up though. Yeah, that uh, that's the the first like big hurdle is the amount of I guess homework you have to do to prepare it. Yeah, so maybe I do limit it to like a week. Uh so I mean, I feel uh, like there are also different scales you could do this at, right? Mm-hmm. Like you could have one that's a week long investigation and then like if that sort of concept works you can flesh it out further for like a long like a and a later mm-hmm. longer version yeah um so maybe there would be like a total of 10 days of entries and the but the players start on like day 4 like you mm-hmm. know there there's a 3 day backlog when they start and so they have like a week to really act but so it's like it's two it's yeah a week and a half of entries that i would make up but the players yeah, start at the backlog. I think the backlog thing is definitely the way to go to put them like sort of under the gun. Like there's some like, oh, shit, we need to act now. Um, mm. Like the, the players are not going to be able to find everything like that's for sure. Like they just don't have enough time um, for everything, especially. Guess, depending on how, yeah. Uh, one of the other things I'm thinking about is whether you would want to deploy this as like a one shot or as the beginning of something else. Because like I, I also yeah. like this as the beginning of a of a of a campaign or something, because the outcome of this investigation would give a lot of different directions to go from depending on, you know, if they get the actual like specific item and what else that leads to, or you could just hook this particular like the outcome of this investigation into other future events. Uh I mean, I think it could work either way. I just, I also like it as the as the beginning of something. It 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 gives a good like, I don't know, first arc of a longer story feel. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is definitely like, uh, it is definitely a like a, a beginning of a, a larger story because like once you get the item, there's like, oh shit, what is this MacGuffin? What do mm-hmm. we do with it? Um, well, I mean, also you know, like. The reason I think that is is because if they fail to get the item, I like the idea of that leading to worse things happening and them having to deal with it. Because mm-hmm. I know yeah. there's there's so many options for how this could play out that I feel like it's it's such a good opportunity to build off of. Yeah. I mean, I know one thing I want to do also is put in like a moral dilemma because, you mm. know, I, I do like those um and that is like finding out that the guy is going to like um, have someone uh, he suspects one of his employees is is talking to the cops. And so mm-hmm. he's going to have him killed. Um, and so the player characters have this chance to rescue this person who might have valuable information. Uh, but oh, they yeah, need it's, to it's do- the good old we've cracked their code, but we're going to let them attack anyway. Question. Yeah, exactly. Um do we let this guy die? Uh, do we tell the FBI, NPC FBI agent about this murder? Uh, well, that's the thing. Is also that's the other thing. Um, mm. Is what is the FBI investigation doing? So, um, the way I I figure it is that the NP like this businessman is like not the primary target of the FBI investigation. He they're, they're targeting like a drug cartel, mm. and he's just one one of many people who's helping launder their money. So they only give a shit when he's talking about drug, drug laundering, um, or money laundering. Sorry, not drug laundering. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so they weren't even, they didn't even assign enough people to like, listen to find out about the murder and they're, they're not going to act on it. Um, hmm. but of course the player characters don't know that because they've limited communication with the NPC. Right. Agent. Right. Right. Um, but do they warn him? Uh, or do they tell him like how, and if they do warn him, do they say, Hey, look, here's an opportunity to get this guy arrested. Uh, but they don't want him arrested because they want him to be free so he can make the deal. 
Like, uh, yeah, because yeah. there's, yeah, making sure that that happens before players are necessarily certain of where to find what they're looking for. Mm hmm. Or, I mean, so, even yeah. if they did get them arrested, like, they could then attempt to, you know, do more traditional Delta Green investigations, like breaking into their house and going through their shit, but far yeah. less likely to lead to anything productive. And, yeah, and and that's the thing is I want players to be able to feel like they they're they don't have to just sit here and listen, mm. you know, just like pick clue one A and C five on <laughs> on this spreadsheet that I made. Um, you sunk my investigation ship. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I I want them to feel like they can they can leave the office and do this shit as well. Uh, for example, I I do want to introduce a mechanic where player characters can take multi- more actions than normal, but at a cost. Mm. Like, they have to make a skill check or a charisma check or something, or one of their bonds takes a point, or they lose a point of willpower from losing sleep. Um, and so they're just getting, you know, this attrition, this fatigue. Yeah, sort of uh, give them more opportunities to burn themselves out for benefit. Mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that that is, so the, yeah, they get to choose whether their bonds or their willpower suffers. Um, or they can do both and just take a lot of actions, but they're they're yeah they're losing their their career is going down. Um, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. That's another thing is is making sure that you know what each of the PCs are also having to do in their normal job. Yeah. Like what yeah. uh, what they're sacrificing. So which on lends that side. it more to the like the campaign play aspect of it yeah, as well. Yeah. So um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I would do a play test where I have like. I'd do 10, 10 spreadsheets. I'll just do mm. 10 and have very abbreviated notes. Like first I'd come up with the daily guy's daily routine and think about what he does on each of these 10 days and thinks about, and then I guess think about where the, in, the critical information is in this mm. spreadsheet. Um, and, and then, and then so what be, you do, then yeah. what you do is you build that up to a massive bloated Kickstarter where all of the au- the audio is is completely recorded and players <laughs> have to actually scrub through it. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> well, because see, I was going to make it like it's going to be like a three by three grid for each spreadsheet. I'm not yeah, going to yeah. make it too big, so it's going to be like morning, afternoon, night. Like that's mm. it. Like I'm not I'm not going to do like a 24 hour like <laughs> oh from one yeah, it, and it's going to be one a to summer. Two, he does yeah. this. Yeah. Um. Because the, like the players, each player can listen to one. Like they have three times of day as well, so they mm. can list. So they, so each player can theoretically listen to all of them. But like, if they don't do their personal stuff as one sector a day, and they don't do their work stuff as one sector a day, they're 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 going to take something. So by default, each player only gets one, gets to pick one of the nine squares per day mm. without a cost. So I guess that would be the simplest way to do it. So it also depends on like how many players there are. So like if you have six yeah. players, then it's going to be a lot easier than with three. Um, so I guess I mean, that might six... be one of those things that would incentivize using this for smaller groups to like keep the pressure on. Yeah. So, but with so I'd balance it, I guess, for three players. So three players get to for free uh, un- uncover three sectors um of the the three out of the nine mm. uh uh spaces um and if they each you know sacrifice everything they can they can uncover the full day but like um i would put in limits so like they have to work at least once every other day yeah um they can sacrifice their personal shit as much as they want so uh they well i mean can't. you also have that extra carrot of like the backlog of information as well Mm-hmm. Uh, alongside the stuff that they start with or as long as uh, alongside the stuff that's happening in real time. Right. So like, um, but they would start also with the, his basic itinerary, his basic schedule. Mm. Um, and yeah, you know, get up, go to work, go to lunch, go back to work, cheat on wife, go home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so yeah. And like, it would be his weekly routine. So like he, he doesn't, it's not uh, this. Yeah. Obviously his weekends are very different than his, um, Weekday, so we'd and we'd start like I guess on a Monday, so like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, he they already started recording. So you get it on Monday, and um, you get his daily schedule. But then like on Tuesday, he references something that happens on sat that happened on Saturday at his mm-hmm. office, um, and so the player goes, "Oh well, we should go listen to that," um, and yeah, uh, 
So maybe I wouldn't like actually go back and like say, oh, he doesn't say anything in this sector because like I'm dividing like eight hour segments. Hmm. So like just checking his house, even like house during the day is probably maybe going to be more quiet. There's not going to be as many people in there, but it's still going to take you time to check that eight hours of recordings. Um, and there's some stuff in there yeah. and you have to like, yeah, there's ignore- only, there's only so yeah. much you can pay attention to something that's sped up to two times speed. <laughs> well, it's also like you have to check it to find out there's other people in the house. So mm. you, there are recordings, but then you have to listen to it to see if he's in it if it, or if it's just his wife and his kids. So yeah, yeah, yeah. he's definitely going to be a family man. There's definitely going to be innocence involved. So there would also be like, Oh shit. Oh yeah. I mean, we got to risk some of that innocent blood. Yeah. And they're perfectly nice people. Hmm. They don't know that they're dealing that they're they're you know that the 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 father All the kid knows is, is that their dad owns a dealership. Their dad owns a dealership, and he's their dad does own a dealership. <laughs> 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 yeah, he does. He works with the cartels, and he has people murdered. But he's a family man, so it's fine. Yeah, um, it's so yeah. So I think I'll do. So all I have to do is come up with base. Well, it would be ninety grids of info, or no. Uh, yeah, 90 grids, nine per day, mm-hmm. 10 days. Um, and some of those are going to be minimal. So I need to come up with something for each of those, I guess. Yeah. Figure uh, out like what, uh, how you'd want to space out either things that are red herrings or things that are, you know, like the murder planning or things like that, that are unrelated. Yeah. So some of them would be, I guess, uh, generic would be the actual critical clues. Mm. Uh, but some of those. Um, are going like if it's if it's uh, if it's eight hours in the afternoon on a Wednesday, mm. um, uh, in in the house for example. Like I want to like give them something for it, so maybe give them like a random benefit. Maybe come with a table for like generic benefit, you know. So mm. like players can um get like a plus ten on their next human roll on him or something like that, or plus ten in human on they just understand this guy better. Um, or they, or maybe it's like an abstract thing where they build the case against the, or they get like a percentage score to just figure out where the deal is going to be. So like, if you just listen to eight hours on a Wednesday, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, in his house, like, uh, yeah. the goals that you build toward in, uh, unknown armies, like build yeah. those percentages that you can then roll. Yeah. I guess that would be a way of doing it. Cause I, w- I don't want players to feel like they've wasted any particular thing. But like there's going to be or at least like, if they do waste yeah. it, it's wasted in interesting ways. Yeah. So because, um, yeah, I don't want to come up with 90 entries. <laughs> so now that I think about it. Um, oh, come on, Ross. Yeah. So I just come up with it. Yeah. So I guess I'd come up with some generic benefits and the, I would just make a table like a D10 table and be like this and I just roll on it. And so like there would be 30, maybe 20 to 30 at- entries that are clues about Mm. something and then the rest of them i just roll on the table so that way i only have to come with like 30 real entries Uh, that that makes sense yeah and then do less work have more tables yeah and i guess yeah so that would be the kind of the fail forward thing where the players if they they just get the bad clues they get they find figure out at the last minute that like i guess the main thing is the the how the scenario resolves so that Mm. I don't want the players to be like, we just don't find the place. Like the question yeah. is how far in advance do they fi- figure out where the place is and when it's going to be. Yeah. So, Cause like, I mean, they would be able to, even if they missed the actual trade off, they could, they would find out after the fact and could like attempt to gather information while like on the back foot, like after the handoff has taken place. Well, I mean, he, let's say like he's handing it to somebody who's going to take it out of town, like somewhere like mm-hmm. that's the only pl- the thing it's there and they have to get it there. Like that's the mm-hmm. only place it's surfacing. But like, I guess the thing would be, I mean, I guess it uh, depends on if you, if you want to run it as something that is going to resolve after this uh, investigation. Well, versus... I do want a, like an action scene at the end. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so like, but like a really good investigation, they find out about the place like a day or two days in advance. So mm. they they can ignore the wiretaps now. They know where and when it's going to be. And they yeah, can they just like, actually prepare. They can set up. They can find the perfect sniper spot and they can figure out a way to block off vehicles once again and they can't leave. And then they can get night vision goggles. And then just like as soon as they get in the warehouse, lock it 
from the outside mm-hmm. and turn the lights off and then just shoot everybody. And then, I mean, you also have the possibility of if they've been neglecting their actual jobs, that adds extra pressure at the end because once they mm-hmm. actually have to go on mission, like how much their job is going to already be pissed at them could add some extra complications. Right. But if they if they succeed, Delta Green will help them uh, yeah, to keep yeah. their jobs, especially but like if they, no, it, but I mean, no free if they rides. get the thing. Yeah, no free <laughs> rides. Well, if they, if they get it, if they don't, they'll be like, well, you're no longer useful to the program or the yeah, fuck you know, you guys. the group. So um, we're, we're disavowing you. Good luck. Um, so I think that would be the basic thing. So like if mm. they really fuck it up, they get they find out like they're listening to him and they they, they just see it's like, oh, we're, we're remember warehouse at 8 p.m. <laughs> Ten, you know, and like, oh, shit, it's there. So they get it at the last minute. So they they show up just as the NPCs are showing up. And yeah, they, they have, have no like, preparation. They have yeah. they don't know who else is going to be there. They just kick in the door and hope for the best. Yeah, basically. Um, and it's only them. Like they can't get the FBI in, involved, obviously, because it's all illegal wiretapping and all that other shit. What? Uh, no. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I guess that would be the uh setup for my scenario so um so yeah i think i think i have a good uh, i'm gonna work on this i definitely Uh, think the random roll tables are a good way of managing what would otherwise be a whole lot like you're you're otherwise you'd end up designing majora's mask you have like a a clockwork music box of everyone's Mm -hmm. movements yeah i can see why this has not been done as an rpg scenario (laughs) even though it's like a staple of law enforcement um because like oh yeah that's it's just a lot of fucking work to do that um so but yeah uh but this is work though it is valuable work um yeah i mean the i mean you know fbi not mm, very (laughs) are good friends at the federal bureau of investigation yeah but (laughs) i am not an apologist for the mafia let me let me just say i the mafia is bad and uh it is good that those mob bosses were taken down they were mass murderers <laughs> so um yeah uh things things are complex uh mm-hmm. but speaking of that uh complex things you yeah. had an idea and so this whole thing was that we both have an idea and uh yours was uh i believe labor organizing yes so i i've been doing some reading in my spare time of uh sort of the history of strikes in america and uh, it got me thinking specifically about red markets because I feel like uh, a world that is this set up on grinding people into paste gives a lot of opportunities for using labor organizing as a, a sort of a plot hook slash goal uh, that has a lot of different ways to approach it. So, like, I guess the problem with mine is I, I have a lot of small approaches that less than I have a coherent, like, singular scenario like yours. Mm hmm. But uh, I think that there are a lot of ways that you could either use this as something that the PCs are taking a a more central role in, or if you want to have this happening at like an enclave that they sort of come to from the outside, ways that they could be brought in and then slowly become a more central part, like depending on how they wanted to approach it. But I guess the, the sort of the beginning that I was thinking of is taking something from uh, either, uh, like I said, either the enclave that the PCs start with or a pre-existing one from one of the uh, modules or something and having one of the major, like, important groups, maybe the people who are, you know, stabbing zombies at the gates or people who are involved in whatever the major sort of trade of that enclave is, uh, you know, want to start, pushing back against the 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 whatever the political slash uh job power is there and the first major problem is of course like we're surrounded by death on all sides so Mm -hmm. how do you not only start to organize this on the down low but how do you set it up to where the community will not turn against your group the instant that you start doing your plans because you can't really kill your way through this I want it to be a much more like social approach, you know? Okay. So at a basic level, the, the PCs are, so is this like a score where the PCs initiate or someone asked them to do this thing? 
Uh, I mean, if if it was something that wasn't part of an ongoing campaign, then I would say I would want to start with the PCs initiating this so you don't have to, like, deal with someone, like, being like, no, that's not what I want to do. Although that could, I mean, you know, having that interpersonal drama in the, the PCs could be interesting, but uh, I would... Uh, I would probably start it as like, okay, here's something that your characters are involved with. Why are they involved in it? What are their goals? And how does this mesh? As opposed to just like, I don't know, waiting for them to do it naturally. (laughs) Right. Well, I mean, a lot of like role playing games are very mission focused. And like often there is a person, you know, the the, the quest giver, the job, the Mr. Johnson, the whatever you want, to, the guy in the tavern uh, with the cloak. And he gives you the map and tells you to go to the dungeon, get the thing. So, um, I mean, uh, that that was the other sort of if this were part of an ongoing campaign, I could see setting up it as a plot hook by having um whatever the group that's starting to organize uh let's just call them the uh the the fence zombie stabbers uh local 101 uh defenseman yeah <laughs> yeah the fenceman uh reach out to the players uh group to possibly just start uh preparing some of the like material support that they think they'll need like either getting in contact with people non-electronically so that it can be like literally running messages between nearby enclaves or uh even just like moving materials around like having them come in from the outside that way uh maybe before they really know what the the group they're working for is doing yeah um so red markets does everything called a job line mm. where you take a series of linked jobs from the same uh employer yeah. so that could be like game mechanic wise like sort of mm. the easiest way to do that where like the fenceman labor organizer wants the takers the player characters to yeah. help them organize all the fencemen of not just this enclave but the all the nearby enclaves as well is that is yeah that right? yeah okay uh, well because so, one of the things that you have to deal with is uh if people try and bring in scabs and so you know reaching out to nearby enclaves to make sure their fencemen aren't going to come in to take your jobs uh if you're standing up to the boss is one of those things you can do to 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 prepare like uh, building that those connections before the the bosses find out what's going on, so they have fewer options. Uh, so it sort of gives you like I guess part of it would be building these social connections, and the the risk, the thing that you're working against is like being discovered, or if you sort of fail at these social connections, you like piss other people off or whatever, like sort of it coming out that way uh, to stop the momentum. Okay. So success is getting the, the, so I guess you have to define like what is success and like what, it, how, how do the player characters succeed? What, what is, what does that look like? Right. And yeah. this is one of the things I was thinking about was essentially building some spreadsheets and background scores for like tracking the wants and like sort of social interests of the people you're interacting with like make it less brute force like social roles and more like well in a lot of ways like the negotiation that you use to make jobs but sort of tweaking that to making it like negotiations to build and maintain social relationships okay see i like that idea of like the player i I, the the main thing is i want it to be more than just like i roll to convince this person yeah, uh, and that's one of the things that's great about red markets are those vignettes of, uh, you know, like the, the that you use for for building or for uh, negotiation. Black, right? Blanked on the word for some reason. Yeah. Uh, so, but like, yeah, using that as a, a backbone for mm-hmm. for social uh, interaction. Yeah. So yeah, like and it's also very rare in uh, role playing games to the that the scenario is about convincing a group of people to take a collective action mm. like uh, most of the time i mean in w- or when it is it's like convincing the king or the mayor to do something you know uh yeah and it, 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 it boils down to a single person and you just have to make a skill check or you have to do his quest and then you, you succeed um so i like modifying the negotiation markets to represent like the collective will of the vincemen to all agree to strike or to do whatever it is um, they feel necessary to organize against the enclave leadership. Yeah. Uh, so like, and, and also with Finsman, like for red markets, you could say, 
they don't strike and stop protecting the fences altogether. They just stop op- doing the extra dangerous work to open up, uh, uh, to draw casualties away from the gate. Yeah, so yeah, that yeah. traders can come it in would, and out. Would, yeah. in, that, in the case of something like that, it would be not exactly a work slowdown, but something like that where they, yeah. they sort of alter what they're doing in a, a way that material affects materially affects things without putting people in danger. Right. So, like, the fencemen say, we're not going to let you send out your trade caravans mm. uh, so you can make extra money from our labor. Yeah, very much like in some of the early railroad strikes, they would stop all freight trains, but they would let uh, passenger trains go through, Mm -hmm. which is one of those things that like managing the public being on your side is hurt what the boss wants to happen, but don't impede what the day to day folk want. Right. Uh, So, yeah, exactly. So like that would be, I guess, the model um, to do this. So why don't we just focus on that, like uh, uh, to keep it keep it simpler for at least for a single because you could make obviously a whole campaign about where like convincing multiple enclaves to all you yeah yeah and that's that's something i would yeah. if i was putting this together in like a a longer like cohesive document i would want to build toward that mm-hmm. uh but yeah i think starting it at like a local enclave and uh like a, a particular thing like the the fenceman is a, a good way to start okay so why don't we say like enclave x they don't pay the fenceman enough uh, for the the dangerous work that they do, hmm. and or they, they just want, they get yeah. it could even just be too many hours, like not enough, uh, right. not enough relief. Okay, yeah, um, they need more money to improve their conditions, mm. uh, their their material conditions. One might say, um, Woo-hoo. <laughs> and uh, the only way to do that is to take collective action um, by doing by stopping trade caravans, which are very profitable, but do not. The community will survive that. It can, yeah, it it will it'll suck, but you know the 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 enclave leaders make most of the money anyway from that. So, um, and so, that, I mean that's also yeah. one of those things. Like especially if they're stopping major caravans, one of the other things, like other side jobs that PCs could do, is help maintain like the necessary supplies for the the you know ground level people on the enclave, so that they don't lash out about these uh, trade caravans being stopped so there's like other side missions you can do other than just like the the focusing supporting the fencemen directly right exactly so like let's just say that the whole thing is to like um actually we'll do two we could do it could either be two negotiation modified negotiations or one Hmm. one so the two version would be there would be the first negotiation would be one convince the fencemen to even do this. Mm. And in the one, uh, for, you know, the one negotiation version of this, um, it's the negotiate, the, 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 the negotiation is to convince the leaders of the enclave to accept the, the terms of the fencemen. So like in the two one, you have convince the fencemen to do this and then, Convince the leaders to do what the fencemen want. Yeah, and like the the worse you are at at getting the fencemen to work together, the more penalties you're going to have at getting the the bosses to uh, accede to their demands. So I guess the thing you could do it, but you could do it just as like you you can just assume like kind of hand wave the fencemen wanting to unionize and mm-hmm. just like focus on actually getting winning the strike you know winning mm-hmm. the work uh, work sh- uh, stoppage i guess partial yeah. work stoppage so um so it depends on where you want to go as a, a gm but each one so as a modified negotiations thing like you would have your phases where they're pushing like either you know the the fencemen you know the fence sitting fencemen um uh, <laughs> or the enclave leadership are pushing down to try and get you to stop and you're trying to push up to get the, can uh, convince them to your side, right. and so like instead of doing individual skill checks, which you know what Red Markets does, hmm. I would say like role play an entire scene where um, so so there's you know there's let's say there's I would just determine I wouldn't roll. Let's say right. there's at least three or four or five segments or turns and each turn you get a scene in which all the player characters can act and do something. So that could be like. Um, that could be like one scene would be convincing one of the, you know, the, the, the fencemen everyone looks up to. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is one of those things for, for on the ground organizing is finding out what relationships and what power dynamics already exist in the place you're trying to organize. So like finding those people that people look up to is, yeah, one of those really valuable things for that. 
Mm -hmm. So that could be like one scene is like, yeah, getting just making those individual skill checks against, you know, individual fencemen to get them to your side. And Mm -hmm. uh, other scenes could. So I guess you would just have to figure out a whole bunch of scenes that player characters can do to build up, I guess. Yeah. Is, like it, at least that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. 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 And I, I'm thinking of it as like, yeah, I like, I like sort of arranging those in separate scenes. And also if one of the other sort of tables I would probably want to come up with is like the different stakes that I wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't want to break it down to like individual fencemen. Cause that feels like that would be a lot, but like what different sort of subgroups are most concerned with and like how you want to, either help or attempt to convince them to put those concerns aside or just those sort of different approaches, how well they would work, what advantages or disadvantages you would get by approaching them that way. Uh, I see it as like a a whole lot of uh, very social interaction, role play focused stuff. Yeah. Um, But you want to like, I think one thing you should do is also have some scenes, the player characters only, they, they may try something but like very early in the scene, it's interrupted by mm. the enclave leadership pushing back. So mm. um, it could be a, a, a straight up fight scene where some like goons ambush you in an alley and try yeah. and break your legs. Um, it could be more subtle, though, um, where like they the people talk some- about. Uh, yeah, they they're starting to stir up the locals about outside interlopers or something like that. That's mm-hmm. always a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like the rumor mongers are gossiping about you. And so you realize that people are, you, you hear the, so the scene starts with you hearing this as you're trying to do something, trying to persuade this block of Finsman mm-hmm. to, to your side. But they're like, Oh, we heard you're a ruthless mm-hmm. mercenary who kills or, people in their sleep. Yeah. Or we heard that you're all secret latents. You're yeah. just uh, disguising your latency. Yeah, exactly. Which is something <laughs> you can totally do. Um, and, so yeah, so that that could be a or you're actually DHQS agents yeah, to, to destabilize like us. That. Yeah. <laughs> so you could uh so the player characters have to push back on this. They have to realize mm-hmm. they have to do something in order to otherwise the the uh they can't just let the they have to respond to the leadership. So there's there would be scenes and and chances for the the, the enclave leaders to push back against this. Hmm. Um, so I guess there that would be my thing is like have that. The, it's not just player characters initiating actions. Yeah. Well, I, I, the way that I imagine that like is um, you get some early turns to try and and build support like outside the notice of the bosses, and so like you can you can essentially choose a risk versus reward thing early on. Like if you're not as interested in, in doing quiet organizing, essentially like you can risk drawing the boss's attention early and starting to get these interferences earlier on for certain benefits. But, uh, you know, the more they interfere, the more you have to spread your energy as a, as a, uh, group around. Mm -hmm. So, um, now were you leaning towards more the two negotiation one or the one negotiation one? Um, I was, I was initially leaning toward the two. Okay. But so, well, so how, so I think that's how the, the first negotiation will go pretty well. Like hmm. player characters do something, player characters do something, um, push back players, push back something like that. So like a five scene thing before you make the role. Yeah. Um, and just say like because it's the beginning fail forward principle. Even in the worst case result, the the defensemen do organize, but like it just I guess depends on what kind of bonuses or yeah, challenges like how, you get. Yeah, yeah, like you, you sort of end up determining how strong their bonds are as a group, how, what their relationship is to the rest of the enclave, and what sort of weaknesses the the boss could come at them with, like that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah, I sort of see that as as sort of the three main things that you're balancing. Yeah. So I guess because you don't want the scenario to stop after the first negotiation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If, it, if it totally it needs fails. to not be like a one and done thing. <laughs> yeah. Um. Maybe like maybe it's not even that. Maybe like there's a secret factor where like there there's a group of raiders and they have a spy among them. Mm. And if you critically fail, if you really fuck up 
the Finsman organizing. They organize, but it's how effective they're organizing. So, like, if you roll really poorly, they're really disorganized. They're really chaotic. And so there's a lot of gaps in the fence, mm. and the raiders take advantage of it. Um, and so you start in the hole by having a scene where you have to fight off the raiders. Yeah. Um, and Or, like, the raiders yeah. attack regardless, but that determines how, how uh, strong they are. And if you roll really well, maybe you get evidence that the raiders were tipped off by the enclave leaders um, as a way to or like. Or yeah. if you want to be a scumbag, that could not be the case. And you could plant that as a rumor against yeah. the boss. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like you don't have to play like clean hand good guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's a site. But then when we get to the second phase, which is actually winning the strike, winning the work stoppage. um do you want that, that that as the same thing, just a collection of scenes? Or um, do you think there would be like a single thing? Um... I think that like the way that I was initially thinking is that, like I said, I don't want it to be about like, okay, you, you did the thing and we're done. Because I mean, sort of like your your example with the, the Raiders is that part of this is that we are we are still in the world of red markets. Like there's other like awful things are going to continue to press down. So, like, thinking about what con- what the consequences and are to the benefits that they're going for. Because, like, you know, these are, like, the fencemen getting, like, fewer hours and, and more free time or whatever or more uh, direct. Or they pay, hire like, more people to yeah. hire more fencemen. Like, that, yeah. that can yeah. cause other things that the Enclave has to, to deal with uh, and, mm-hmm. like, you know, make sure that we're still... We still have enough supplies for everyone, uh, all those sorts of things. Like, managing. oh, okay, yeah. I like that. So, like, the because, <laughs> like, you know, as much as I am a big like pro labor guy, it doesn't make us suddenly live in utopia. It just gives us more options for dealing with. <laughs> so maybe with the fail forward principle, hmm. the second negotiation is about whether or not they win the strike. Hmm. Um, it's about what and like if they can see the price. Anything. Like yeah. they don't necessarily get exactly what they wanted. Right. So, like, if you do really well, like, if the best possible thing is the Enclave leaders take it entirely out of their own paychecks, out of mm-hmm. their own profit margins. So only the only the leaders have to, like, they just don't get as much money. Yeah. Like, and so the, it just, it, so there's more Fitzman hired, more people have jobs. Um, it, the place yeah, is like safer. Going with, the, uh, yeah. going with some of the early, like, strike examples, like, people would people would be going for all different combinations of things. Uh, some groups would be going for just like a reduction in hours. Some people would be very specifically reduction in hours with no reduction in pay. Some people wouldn't be going for reduced hours and would just be going for more pay. So there's like mm-hmm. a lot of different approaches that um, could be attempted and different things might succeed or fail uh, depending on what, what you put in in the first negotiation. Right. Well, let's say like the best case is like to make it safer for the fencemen and that more fencemen are hired so that like no mm. one's overworked. So like that yeah, that's yeah. the main thing is that they're so not like, getting so like more, re- yeah. reduce hours, hire more dudes. Yeah. So but like the money comes, the resources come from the le- enclave leaders mm. and no one else. And all it comes is from their like their essentially their the their extra profit margin. Yeah. So like um so that's the best case scenario. So, like, maybe the worst case scenario is the Enclave leaders agree to it, but they take the money out from other Enclave resources. Yeah, they, like, start w- using yeah. it to pit people against each other. Yeah, so, like, the worst case scenario is they take it out of the free clinic. Mm-hmm. So, like, uh, people don't have as much good medical care and, and like, people resent the fencemen for taking this money. Um, mm-hmm. And sewage, you know, like, the infrastructure, just basic shit for the poor. Yeah. Um, and so like, that's the worst case scenario. Um, or maybe the worst case scenario is that they invite the Raider, they partner, decide to like hire the Raiders to just kill all the fencemen. Yeah. They and, just, like, they just yeah. Yeah. hire the Raiders to kill or kick the fencemen out. Like, yeah. <laughs> and so like Pinkerton's. the players have to like, <laughs> so then that triggers another action scene where the player characters have to like fight off the Raiders. And mm. I guess you know bring the enclave leaders to heal for like yeah. you know doing this shit like um well, i mean but that that's the worst be, case yeah. that can also be like one of the other like some of the optional other jobs you could take as part of this line is like if the fencemen are worried about retaliation and if they want like your your group to escort like their families to another like nearby enclave that's agreed to take them or something like that because that's 
again, like I'm pulling a lot from just stuff I've been reading. Like there were there were like there's like the Lawrence textile strike where the, like kids were sent up to New York uh, because the the strike was being you know physically attacked and so, they didn't have like money or uh, you know things yeah. to take care of their families at the time. So the player characters in the second phase, though, when they're dealing mm-hmm. directly with the Enclave leadership, um, do you just mechanically do you see this as another series of scenes? Um, or do you want to have like, there is a specific submission you have to do to get the the thing that you want. And that determines it. Um, cause I mean, obviously the scenes are more versatile. You can have a lot more. Yeah. Things. I was like, definitely leaning more toward the, the, the collection of different scenes okay. sort of set up, especially since after the first, um, after the first chunk of, of negotiation, you now also have connections in the community that you've been like mm-hmm. building or leveraging depending on your approaches. Because uh, I know the, one, and so they're dealing with the Enclave leader, so it's more yeah. high stakes. Um, mm. So, like, I could see a, a bribery scene where the Enclave leaders say, we'll just give you 50 bounty to fuck off. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, or whatever, you know, mm. or like not 50, but like enough for leg of your retirement or like yeah. one. one well, they, yeah. You know, they can, they can, uh, I mean, depending on what's going on, they could take Milestone. advantage of your spots yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah, just like here's 20 bounty. That's a milestone for your retirement. Yeah. Fuck off um, or denounce, denounce the strike. Yeah. Uh, I want I want you to take over. Um, I'll give you this cushy job or mm. um, yeah. M- instead of leg breakers, it's like assassins in the night um, or uh, yeah, more rumors. Yeah. Mm. Um, it could be a pull, full out street battle. I mean, I guess I mean, you, in the terms of the encounters, it's like really what your group the kind of things your group wants to do is how yeah. I would do it as a GM. Like if they're social role player intriguers, lots of social stuff, but if they're combat monsters, boy, there's going to be a lot of street fighting. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Cause like, kind- I, I feel like this one would be a lot less, uh, concretely laid out than like the options in yours where you have like, here are these timetables. Here's this, like there's a, you know, doing these sort of tiered negotiations uh, gives a lot more room to sort of tailor it to what your uh, your group is wanting to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't really. I mean, traps. Obviously, that could be another like you know the equivalent of a red market's equivalent of a car bomb um, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, but I can't really think of any puzzle types. But like that's that's more of a dungeon crawling thing. Um, I mean, that can also be like you know investigations, finding out more of. Uh, oh yeah, like, like did the did the enclave leaders hire raiders to scare the yeah. uh, the, the enclave? Because um, yeah, that could be like just hiring raiders to like do psychological warfare, just like yeah. roll up outside the enclave and you just walk away, just walk away. We're going yeah. to come and kill you all, you know. <laughs> uh, do a road warrior impression essentially as uh, you're weak, your fencemen don't even guard your walls. You're pathetic. We'll crumb and crush you. But then they, they don't attack. They just were messing with them. Yeah, um, just intimidation. Yeah. So in that case, the player characters said, like, those guys are just fucking lying. They're just. And then, of course, the Raiders hear about that through, you know, Ubik. And um, that could be a whole thing of like, mm. stop talking shit about us. Next time you're out doing a job out in the waste, we'll find you. Uh, so, yeah, we don't even know them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I like, I mean, I really like this idea. Uh, like, again, convincing a group of people to take a thing, to do a thing is not, is underutilized in RPGs. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. it's Because uh, uh, I, I guess my, my sort of overall goal is to have whatever enclave you're working in, like, get fleshed out a lot more in terms of, like, the relationships of the people working there. And, uh yeah, just like being being a little more present in the day to day, which I mean is often more of just a vignettes kind of thing. Yeah, maybe like in terms of the negotiation. Remember, they have the two tracks. Yours mm-hmm. goes up from left to right, and theirs goes from right to left. And you know, so maybe every single encounter, the the enclave leadership push it back in some way. But the, mm-hmm. so it's up to the player characters to determine if the enclave leader, with, like it's not up to the the individual skill checks. It's like, do the players succeed in the scene? Did the enclave succeed in the scene? If they both do, they, they both move towards the middle. Um, they both move on their tracks. But if like the players succeed and they stop the enclave from doing the thing, just the players advance or vice versa. So like it's a buy. It's not a. It's not a skill check like a negotiation. It's a. Each scene has a very specific agenda. 
like mm. a very specific goal for like the players, you know, the, 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 the labor organizers versus the enclave leaders. And so like, if the enclave leaders do this, then they get to go up. If the player characters do this, they get to go up. And when they meet in the middle, um, then you need to figure out how that, how you want to resolve that. Um, mm. so I guess when they meet in the middle, then it's a binary thing. Either this, it's a mutually exclusive thing. Like, um, the player character or yeah, it only like, it one like of limits them your exclusive. options a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. So it's more confrontational. So, mm. um, I yeah. See, yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah. But like when they're both away from each other, they can both succeed. Um, so it's harder to, maybe it's harder to oppose them when they're far away on the track because they're, what they're doing is in the background and you're not as, you know, the rumor. Yeah, you have less like access to yeah. information to prepare or. Yeah. Um, well, cool. Uh, I like that idea. So when are you going to run it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. All right. Uh, I got, well, I got yeah. notes. I'll see what I can put together. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. If you ever want to run it, I'll, I'll be happy to do it. And when I, let, when I figure out the wiretapping thing, I'll definitely let you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, sounds, write, that sounds you good. Know, 30 entries and a random table and uh, a yeah, background. All of the tables, man. Ross. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing for mine was that you really, I really have to know this businessman really well. Yeah. Like I have to really detail the shit out of him. Um, so, cause the players are going to know this guy inside and out by the end of it. Um, and yeah. Uh, but anyways, really, uh, so really this was get in the head of that horrible criminal. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this is sort of like my idea for, uh, an episode, uh, just like, I like working on scenario ideas and, uh, and that well, this too, certainly so. has been an episode. Yeah, uh, but we're not done. Obviously, when we get back, we will have uh, shout outs. Woo! And we're back. I'm not sure what music I'm going to put in there, but it'll probably be paperweight. Just, no, just pretend that you know. Just be like, wasn't that a great track? Oh, track, it'll all, I, I only pick great was. tracks. Yeah. <laughs> I only pick great tracks. Uh, so <laughs> DJ. Payton. Uh, yay. Um, I didn't so, say morning zoo. Peyton, calm down. <laughs> hey, it's cool. Rat. Uh, all right. So shout outs. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. I've got quite a few actually. Um, so the first one I want to mention is a film I watched uh, not too long ago a uh, Shaw Brothers movie in 1966 uh, Kung Fu movie called Come Drink With Me. And I was, I had very little knowledge of this movie uh, before I, I watched it. And I was honestly really impressed with it. Um, it is got a very sort of very Kung Fu movie kind of story. A group of bandits kidnap an official uh, and they hold them hostage uh, because, and they demand that the government release their leader uh, as a, a you know an exchange of hostages really and yeah just a good old classic mhm but um the official's sister who is disguised as a man uh, golden swallow um comes to his rescue but and she is a kung fu badass and then the story uh there's ah, there 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 are actual layers to the story and there's some really elegant storytelling in it and um, for a 1966 uh, film, there's some really good fight choreography. I mean, obviously, fight choreography in martial arts movies has dramatically improved in the decades. Uh, I mean, I but, would say it's it also varies a lot, even within each era. I mean, yeah, um, there, are, there can be good 60s kung fu movies, just not a lot of them. Yeah, no. Well, it's just like, you know, the hits look more real. I mean, to me, and mm. they're faster. But like, um like the actress who plays golden swallow is actually was a ballet dancer. And so there's a very elegant, uh, mannerism to, to her, uh, attacks. And, hmm. um, but like, like there is a character in, in the, in the movie that is introduced very early on. And you're like, Oh, this is how this character is. Oh, that's kind of like a stock character. Sure. Whatever. But then he starts, you start picking up on hidden depths on this character. You're like, Oh, okay. What's going on with that character? And then like golden swallow, you think, okay, Oh, she's just a hero. She's just going to find the bands, kick their asses. End of story. Like, Nope, not that simple. (laughs) Um, and yeah, there's, there's just, there's a lot going on with this movie and I don't want to spoil too much more about it, but I would like to discuss it. So I choose to be vague. 
Yeah, I choose to be vague, but I would really like to discuss it with somebody at some point um, once we have both seen it because... I will, uh, uh, I will run down a copy. I am intrigued. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, w- what's your first shout out there, Thad? Uh, what did I say? Oh, yes. Uh, I've been playing on my Switch uh, Collection of Saga Final Fantasy Legend, which is a, a re-release of the the first three Final Fantasy Legend games, as they were called in America. Uh, they were the first games in the Saga series, uh, if you know them by their Japanese title. And they're very weird. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's, it's one of those things, it's fun to go back and see people try things in games in a way that I rarely see outside of, like, things that I find on itch or something mm-hmm. in the present. Because, like... You, you're the way that your characters develop depends a on on which you know uh, type of character you pick. You can be a human uh, a man or a woman, uh, a mutant man or woman, or mm-hmm. various kinds of monsters. And uh, mutants de- develop randomly, mm-hmm. like literally their 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 HP and their their stats will go up at random and what spells they have will change at random and uh, screw you if you don't like it. <laughs> um, and humans are, they only level up by taking items. Uh, so the only way you increase your stats is by buying stuff from a shop to use. Uh, but both humans and mutants can use uh, items and weapons. Whereas monsters can use no items and no weapons and the only way that they level up is by eating the flesh of other monsters that you kill. <laughs> and nice. uh, it's also somewhat random, uh, at least in the first one. I've, I've only been playing through the first one so far, but I've, mm-hmm. I've had a real good time with it. You're going up a, uh, a tower of different worlds mm-hmm. and uh, exploring and trying to get further uh, up the tower, at the peak of which, I presume, I will be killing God, as is the custom of the era. As is but, the custom of the era, yeah. And I mean, it also has some nice side options. Like you can, uh, you can speed up the ROM essentially, which is nice. Uh, mm-hmm. But it doesn't speed up the music or the sound effects, so you can move <laughs> faster. But it doesn't make anything sound weird, which I think is a nice little option. Considering oh, nice, the, yeah, the incredibly slow walking speed. <laughs> yeah, uh, nice. So it's yeah, it's it's a nice little package. There, there was another one that I haven't started playing yet. Uh, because this one has three games in it and I haven't finished it. But mm-hmm. they also have Collection of Mana, which mm-hmm. is like the first three Seiken Densetsu games or oh, uh, yeah, Final yeah. Fantasy Adventure was the first one that what it was called uh, when it came out in America. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I've, 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 I enjoy buying these little like less expensive weirdo collections of things on the Switch. Switch mm-hmm. has a lot of good like throwback collections. There's also one that has like all the Kunio Kun and uh, like Double mm-hmm. Dragon Brawler games nice from like it's uh that's a lot of fun cool but, um uh, but yeah so that's a uh, collection of saga good time uh you mentioned itch uh dot io mm-hmm. uh and i actually bought something from itch uh i haven't played it yet but it's a physical game and uh, but the the description really well okay the title just grabbed me and then i read mm-hmm. the description is like all right i'm sold um it's called bar the windows bolt the doors Ooh. It, it's a horror storytelling game uh, about your group of outsiders uh, who are went to this isolated community. Oh no, they hate they they hate us. We must flee into the woods. Oh look, there's a cabin. Into the cabin. Oh, a cabin uh, in the woods, you say? Yeah. And the thing is, there's you you. Uh, uh, it's a game about surviving something, trying to break into the cabin, hmm. um, and. So it's almost like a RPG or a board game. It's kind of like uh, sitting between like they, there's a map of the cabin and you have to take turns and like you can barricade the doors or move or look for something useful. And uh, kind of yeah, m- reminds yeah. me of the opening of uh, Resident Evil 4 like mm-hmm. trying to escape the villagers trying to kill yeah. you. Exactly. And so I really want to try it out. Um, but I, I was just it was it was a intriguing enough premise for me to 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 plop down some money for the PDF. Uh, nice. So, uh, yeah, I'll be running that at some point. Um, I don't know how yeah, long I, it'll take I've, to actually play through a game. But yeah, yeah, I've saved too many games that I want to look at later on itch. And mm-hmm. it's uh, now terrifying to go through my lists. Yeah, no joke. <laughs> um, but yet another thing. Shut up. Oh, yes, I did. 
Um, I think I mentioned earlier part of the inspiration for my uh, scenario idea was I've been reading the uh, the 50th anniversary edition of the book Strike by uh, Jeremy Brecker or Brecher. I don't know how you pronounce it, um, but it uh, it was reissued in the last couple of years by PM Press and it caught my attention uh, because a, a journalist I really like Kim Kelly wrote the the forward to it. But um, it's just a, a great history of uh labor uprisings in the u.s so oh, well, fun time pro pro yeah mm-hmm. um so my next shout out is uh unrelated to any of that but uh <laughs> they related to rppr for sure um the movies grave encounters one and two mm. which are on uh have been put up on shutter but they came out like 10 years ago yeah they um, used to be on netflix pretty consistently if i recall yeah i think that's where i first saw them um and they're probably one, some of the most pure architectural horror movies I've seen. Mm. Uh, so it's a very simple premise. Grave Encounters 1 is uh, found footage. They're both found footage movies, horror movies. Um, so, But don't let that put you off of them. Um, the first one is a reality show, you know, ghost hunting reality show where they go to this abandoned insane what, asylum. What everyone has always wanted to happen to ghost hunters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And spooky things start happening, but like it turns what's really brilliant about it is that the it's not just like, oh, no, spooky things in the dark. It's it goes house of leaves on them in that like the they just keep it just keeps getting bigger the more they wander inside it. Um, Like, I feel like architectural horror is one of those genres that if you have a basic competence, you can do well with a very limited budget. Yeah. Yeah, and this is a perfect example of that. This is probably the best example of that I've actually seen. Mm. Um, and they make it work really well, and uh, it's a really, really good film. Now, Grave Encounters 2 is a kind of a meta found footage horror film because it's about a film student who's obsessed with Grave Encounters 1, and then he gets mysterious instructions from the internet about going at where to find the, this insane asylum. <laughs> um, but it's not as good as 1, but it has a couple of scares, a couple of scenes that I think are the best in either film. Like there's Ooh. one in particular, um, which I am going to spoil just to give you an idea of that. It is also worth watching great uh, because it starts kind of weak. It starts them out on college and like, oh, they're at a party, uh, you know, um, very, very kind of like not scary stuff. But like there's a scene where the, the college students uh, escape from the asylum. And <laughs> they're just like, oh, thank God we got out. And then they get to the hotel and they're like, we need to go. So they pack their stuff. They go to their hotel room. They pack all their stuff. And then they get in the elevator. Uh, <laughs> the elevator opens up to the basement of the insane asylum. Nice. <laughs> like they drove their car oh. like miles through it. But that like, rules. nope. Yeah. Have you uh, actually that reminds me. Uh, I haven't watched, I've only watched the first season of, uh, channel zero, but, uh, that also gives me vibes of like no end house. Yeah. Um, I actually mentioned that in the last episode of RPPR. Um, no end house is really fucking good. Uh, uh, I need to watch the rest of that series. The first, that's season also on shutter. A lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. If you have shutter, it's on that, uh, the whole series. Um, Greg Stolze actually told me season three and four are really good too, but mm. Um, oh, I may have to check those out later. Um, do you Greg have any more shout a good opinion haver. He is. Uh, um, no, I have two really? more. Okay. Uh, yeah, no. All right, two video games I've been playing lately. Um, they're both on uh, Xbox Game Pass, which is like Netflix, but for video games. Mm. Um, and uh, one is a big game, but it's worth mentioning because it hasn't. I haven't seen it get a lot of press. Um, Psychonauts Two. Um, oh. Yes, it, it, I love the original, which came out on the original Xbox, you know. Yeah, um, it was back in, like, original Xbox PS2. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's, they released sequel, same voice actors for, for this. Um, they sound just as good. Uh, brilliant art direction. Bri- it's a platformer where you play a Psychonaut, uh, a Rasputin, uh, a Quato, uh, or Raz. And um, Ra- Psychonauts are psychics, obviously, but, mm. like... Their main thing is actually traveling into people's minds and you're it's basic and it's therapeutic. These people have a broken mind. They have some kind of trauma and you help them process it and heal. 
Um, so like the, and their mental landscape is reflects who they are. And so like the first person you, you, you do, uh, you go in their head is a, uh, actually the villain from the last game uh-huh. and you've captured him. And now you're, you're trying to, uh, find out who, who he was working for. Um, and he's terrified of this person. Um, but they also this, this dentist, uh, has a lot of trauma and you're helping them come to terms with themselves. Um, so you're basically going through this mental landscape that has like teeth that you jump on giant teeth and like very like gross kind of way. Um, and, uh, yeah, so you fight like sensors, like those are the basic enemy, like dudes mm-hmm. with a big no stamp. Those are the sensors that push out unwanted thoughts. Like, I don't know, intrusive psychics. Um, and, but yeah, there's really, every level is very unique. There's like one level that's like a 1970s game show, cooking game show. And you have to pick Ooh. up these giant ingredients and put them in cooking pots and pans and like all, all, all the while avoiding like cleavers and fires and all these other dangers. Um, so, and there's lots of exploration and side missions and mm. well voiced, well acted uh, uh, characters. Um, yeah, I have not, like to my shame, I have not played the first one. But uh, Kara was saying she wanted to play through it with me because she had, and then we can move on to the new one. So I'm I'm hyped mm-hmm. about that. Yeah, um, you don't need to play the first one to play Psychonauts two. They explain yeah, but I mean it's just a good game. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I might want to replay it myself too because it's been a while. I did beat it, but it was a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that's quite fun. Ooh, uh, I actually yeah. did think of one that okay. I've forgotten. Mm-hmm. Uh, you reminded me of it by mentioning the uh, the dentist character. Mm-hmm. Because you know who worked as a dental technician? Mm-mm. Junji Ito. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, before he was a, a manga horror superstar. Mm-hmm. And um, I recently p- I picked up his recent, or at least recently translated book, Sensor. Yeah. Is the title of it. It's, uh, it's not a, a collection of stories. It's just a, a single sort of graphic novel. And mm-hmm. it's this great, like weird cult cosmic horror stuff going on Ooh. um and as ever like there's a lot of just crazy body horror stuff and <laughs> uh some great like building of tension and erosion of sanity amongst the characters that we follow so like you know. uh yeah i mean it lo- like low-hanging fruit junji ito did a good book <laughs> <laughs> shocking uh but we do we do love and respect uh jinji ito in this house um yeah he must so, be protected at all costs he must be protected um so cool yeah i'll i'll have to read that um my final shout out is another game that's also on game pass it's also on steam um streets of rogue uh Ooh. which is a top down like gta ish game but it's a roguelike and mm. it's real interesting it has very simple graphics um sorry it's very like simple when you graphics. say gta yeah. you mean like original gta yeah yeah you don't drive a car you're just on foot but like mm. it's it's a top-down view and it has these simple pixel graphics but it's deceptively complex um basically you have to go from the bottom of this vertical city so like you have to go up all these floors um to get to the mayor and then you have to get rid of the mayor and become mayor what you're uh, saying there's a weird architecture aspect to this there is but like <laughs> each floor is organized with buildings and people we're running about and so most of them are actually neutral to you um and at least to start with and so mm. but you have to do missions on each floor to progress um and they're kind of ran and they're randomly generated like get this item kill this guy uh rescue this person um but like the game is done in such a way that you can like, there's multiple ways of resolving things. Like you can just Mm. kick in doors or knock on doors. And when people open them, bash their head in (laughs) and go inside to get the thing or some buildings have air filtration systems. You can pour in syringes of things into the air filtration system (laughs) to either knock them out or poison them. And, uh, which is also another way of, you know, doing you want, or you could, if you have access to explosives, you can plant a bomb on the outside of the wall and just walk in. Um, and different classes play different. Well, like I did, I've done best with the gorilla class. Hmm. Uh, the gorilla class can't talk to humans, so he can't buy items in shops, although he can't use vending machines. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, are you saying gorilla like a soldier or are you saying gorilla like an animal? gorilla, like a, a big ape? <laughs> um, so that's why he can't talk to people. 
But uh, you can rescue other gorillas uh, because scientists <laughs> are enemies of gorillas. Of course um, they are. And so you, if you rescue other gorillas, they'll follow you. And so you can have a gang of gorillas going around Rules. punching the shit out of people um, or using melee weapons. You can't use a gun as a gorilla, but you can no. use melee weapons and throwing stars. Um, and yeah. Apes together strong. Apes together strong. And bananas heal you twice as much. As they do for normal people, <laughs> um, so there's there's a lot there's a lot of interlocking systems. Uh, all the characters have their own AI. Um, it's it's very like I was playing way too long last night. Uh, I say I'm way too late playing it because I was doing so well as a gorilla, um, <laughs> and yeah. So Ooh, there's it's and there's also like on Switch. I might pick that up. Mm-hmm. It has co-op. Um, it has uh, a lot of things going for it, so um, it's it's worth checking out. Um, it's it, it is best played with a controller, I think. Um, I haven't tried it without a mouse with a mouse, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, up to four player co op. But uh, yeah, Streets of Rogue, really interesting game. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, that's that's pretty much it for this episode. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Thad. Uh, how can and again? How can people find you on the internet? Uh, I am on Twitter, unfortunately, to to the shame of all humanity, mm-hmm. at Thaddeus Strange. Okay. Uh, soon to be on Twitch at so, well, I mean, I have a Twitch account, so you can yeah. find me there. I'm not doing anything right now, but I will be soon. Right. At also, Thaddeus Strange. <laughs> uh, so, if you like this episode, if you have any thoughts on uh, how to do a scenario about wiretapping or labor organizing. Um, uh, let us know I mean, in the also, there are yeah. two things that can work together if you want to have the boss wiretapping the the labor organizers. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole that, but that's an entirely different structure for scenario. So, um, yeah, the yeah. Anyways, uh, <laughs> let us know what you think uh, on comments on here on the site, um, or go to if you're a patron, go to the RPPR patron Discord. Feel free to chat on our channels about it and uh we'll all talk to you next time bye bye